But if you want to bring folding lawn chairs with you, um, if you have the kind that reclines, like I do, I have the kind that rocks and reclines at the same time. It's fantastic. Um, though I'll be standing, I'll be preaching, I can't sit in it. But anyway, if you have that kind and you want to make me jealous, then come and bring it uh, and, and, uh, and, and bring that with you. Also, if you have uh, kids and you want to bring a, bring a blanket and, and let the kids sit on the blanket while we worship or whatnot, but uh, just know that we're going to offer that at 7.30 uh, Easter Sunday morning, and then we're going to have a 10.30 worship service indoors. So we'll have a 7.30 sunrise service outside. We'll have a 10.30 service inside. There'll be no Sunday school that morning, and so we invite you to come and, and to, uh, to bring your friends. And then on Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before Easter, we were, we're going to have a picnic dinner uh, at 5.30. We're going to ask that you bring food just for you and, you, and your family, uh, so, you know, we can, you know, because of the coronavirus stuff, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, if you bring food for your family and it's something that I like to eat, I'm going to come and get it, okay? Basically, if a 12-year-old will eat it, I'm going to eat it, all right? And so uh, just, I'm just going to warn you, put that out there. So, but, but be sure you come and, and join us for that. We're going to have, uh, we're gonna have games. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally, hopefully, the Lord willing, if the weather permits, I'm going to put the volleyball net I've been dying to put up uh, out here in the back. We'll play volleyball. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt for the kids uh, we're asking people to, to, to bring candy. If you can go buy a bag of candy, bring it to the church and drop it off uh, so we can have uh, candy to put inside Easter eggs. We already have the Easter eggs. We got a ton of those. Uh, we just need somebody, uh, some, some folks to bring us some candy. And then we need uh, some volunteers who would be willing to come and fill uh, those Easter eggs, okay? Um, and so if you want to, if, if you're willing to volunteer to come do that, we're going to do that either uh, that Sunday afternoon before the picnic or we'll do it that previous week. Whenever that time is, I promise, if you come, I'll buy you food. I'll buy you, I'll, buy, I'll, I'll, I'll spring for the pizza, all right? Maybe we can have like a little pizza party and fill the eggs. Um, so let us know that if you'd like to volunteer for that. Um, and, and if you have any questions, go see Alan Dennis. I saw Alan, is Alan in here? He's around here somewhere. Or is he keeping the nursery? He's, gonna, he's in the nursery. Go see the, the wonderful gentleman in the nursery, one of our deacons, and he'd, he'd love to give you more information about uh, how you can help out with uh, the Palm Sunday picnic dinner. And then also the mission of the month is helping in his name, Food Pantry. You see those needs there. Uh, you can come and drop those items all off at the church. And, uh, and remember that we're going through the book of Revelation on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings in the, in the morning devotionals, and then the men's Bible study, which happens on, at 7 o'clock on Thursday evenings. Well, with that, I believe all the announcements are out of the way. Um, I'm going to invite Alan Hawkins to come and, and lead us in worship. Let's prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. And it is an amazing thing that one day we will stand in heaven and everything will be clear. We'll look back, we'll recount the deeds of God, and even at times in our life we'll be saying, I get it now. I understand what was happening. Even though at times there may be grieving, maybe sorrow, maybe joy, times of plenty, times of little. In Revelation, the great the song of Moses, they sang, Great and amazing are all of your deeds. All of your deeds. And that great God who is working all things for His purpose and His pleasure has redeemed us in Christ and called us to enter into His temple now, to be in His presence now. So let's take the time to prepare our hearts to worship this great God and Savior. Our Father, it is a wonderful thing to be able to come into your house and to have your word that has been written and prepared for us. That we may have it preached to us, that we may read it, and we may understand, Father, we may understand things today that your servants didn't understand a hundred or a thousand or two thousand years ago. We are able to understand them. But one day, Father, we will all stand in your presence, and we'll all be singing to one another, declaring what a wonderful God you are, what wonderful things you have done to redeem a people to yourself. 
You give yourself glory and honor through the praise of a redeemed people. We thank you for that opportunity, and we pray, Lord, that we might begin to do that today, to worship our great God and Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let us stand to hear the invitation to worship from Revelation 15.3, saying this together. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Let's sing a song of praise. Hymn number 5, verses 1, 3, and 4. serve a great God. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How often have you sat in the place where the weight of your sin is overwhelming? Maybe some of you here have never really dealt with that. If you haven't, I pray that you do this morning, that there there is a great comfort in what Christ has done for us in our deepest, in our darkest place when the weight of sin is more than we can bear. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 30 say this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What a wonderful word that is to those who understand it. And what a wonderful word that is to those who, who suffer and live in darkness. Those who the Lord is bringing to them who feel the weight of that sin. What do they do with that guilt? And Christ calls us to himself. And that is a beauty that we have as Christians, is to go before the Lord and seek his forgiveness for how we have failed him, how we have sinned against him from day to day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, in silent prayer, and confess our sins to him and ask for his forgiveness. Now as the Lord's church, let us confess our sin together, praying the prayer in the worship guide. Holy God, you have done all the work necessary for us to no longer be under your condemnation and alienated from you. In love, you rescued, redeemed, and restored us, but too often in our sin, we run from you. Forgive us and let us see the gracious depth to which your Son went in order for us to be saved and transformed for your glory. Amen. Now let us stand and hear the assurance of the gospel. From Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That is wonderful news. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a song of praise. Hymn number 210, verses 1 through 4.
Amen. You may be seated. This time we'll continue to worship the Lord through our giving. Um, please feel free to present your offerings to the plates and the, to the side and to the back of the church uh, if you need to do so. At this time we're going to sing a hymn number 265 verses 1, 2, and 3. Father, thank you so much for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Lamb, our Lamb, our sacrifice. For He died in our place. He had to die in our place so that He, he would bear the condemnation, the wrath, the punishment that was meant for us because of our sin against you. And oh God, what love, what grace, what mercy, what compassion that drove you to do this. Father, help us to dive deep into that love, into that grace and that compassion this day. As we open your word, oh God, draw us deeply into your word. Draw us deeply into your heart. Draw us deeply into your love. And all these things ask your son's precious name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll dismiss the children to go to Children's Church.
Go with me once more to the Lord in prayer. And now, O oh God, as we open your word, open our minds and our hearts to receive your word. And may we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, perceive your mind and heart. So that we may know the depth of your grace. So that we may be transformed to live lives that glorify your holy name. And all because we peered into your word and we saw you. Father, change us, transform us by what we see and by what we hear from your word this day. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. And all God's people said, Amen. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew 27 with me. And as you're turning, I'm going to ask that you stand in honor of the public reading of God's holy word. Matthew 27. And I'm going to be reading verses 27 to 31. Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31. Beginning in verse 27, hear now, for this is God's holy word. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail! King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So we've come to this time of year where we slow down to look intently into the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And for the next four Sundays or so, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look in depth into the crucifixion and resurrection narratives from the end of the book of Matthew. And why is this helpful? Why is it helpful to gaze deeply into the crucifixion and resurrection narratives? It is because as we look deeply into what Christ did for us, we will see deeper into the love of God. When we understand the depth to which God went through, in and through the person and work of His Son, Jesus Christ, then we will understand further the depth of God's love. Or maybe put like this, the deeper the understanding that we have of our own sin and our own separation from God, the deeper the understanding we have of God's grace and love for us. There's why so many, so many Christians have, have sort of a small view of God or a small view of grace and a small view of, of God's love. It's because they have a small view of their very own sin. And therefore, they have a small view of how deep God had to dive into our sin, into our muck, into the pit in, in which we found ourselves in to rescue us. So the deeper down we go into what God has done for us, the deeper we will see our own sin, and the even deeper we will see the grace and love of God. Our sin is great, but His mercy is more. Amen? Our sin is great, but His mercy is more. And what we're going to see in Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31, are loving actions of Jesus. I mean, this is not some kind of throwaway narrative. This is not some kind of like extra action added onto the end of the story before the crucifixion. This was a necessary event for a very specific purpose. And as we seek to understand this necessary event, then we will understand further the grace and love of God. So as we gave, gaze deeply into the death and resurrection of Jesus, we will, we will begin to see the depth to which God went to order it, it went to in order to rescue rebels and to save sinners. We're going to see a further and deeper expression of God's grace and love. So this is where we're going to go this morning, if you're taking notes. We're going to dive right into it. Number one, we're going to see Jesus mocked. 
Jesus robed, Jesus crowned, and Jesus praised. Jesus mocked, Jesus robed, Jesus crowned, and Jesus praised. And what I'm going to propose to you this morning is that this was a necessary, divine, sovereign action that, that was done for us in order for us to be saved. That this had to happen in order for us to be saved for a very specific reason and purpose. So let's look at, first of all, Jesus mocked. If you notice the word mock pops up twice in our text, which seems to imply that this was one of the main reasons, one of the main themes that, that, that Matthew recorded, Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31. It's because he wanted us, he wanted his readers to see that Jesus was mocked. And not just not just mocked, but mocked to an excessive extent. This is excessive mocking. This is excessive humiliation. This is excessive uh, being made fun of and, and, and being considered a, a joke. And there's a reason why God wanted his son to go through this. And notice also that our text this morning interlocks Jesus' arrest with his trial and crucifixion. If you back up just a, just a page or two, you'll notice that he went before Pilate. He went before the crowds. He went before Pilate again. He even stood before the Sanhedrin. He went, he went from trial to trial to trial. And then you have this interlocking narrative here right before he goes to his crucifixion. And as I was reading this this past week, I couldn't help but ask this one question. And maybe uh, as, you, as we were reading this out loud just a little while ago, maybe you were asking the same question I was asking this whole week. And that is why. Why did Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31, have to happen? I mean, think about it. He went before the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he was mocked there. He had his beard torn out. He was literally punched in the face. He went before Herod, mocked there, humiliated. Went before Pilate, mocked and flogged and humiliated. So why this extra mockery here at the end of chapter 27 leading into the crucifixion? Why did this have to happen? Why this excessive extreme humiliation? Why this excessive and extreme mockery? Wasn't it enough that he had to die on the cross? I mean, why not have this? Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene. Why verses 27 to 31? Why is that there? In fact, it, it, it's there by, by divine appointment. Apparently, it wasn't enough that, that he was uh, mocked by the Sanhedrin, that he was mocked by Pilate and then went straight to the cross. Apparently, verses 27 to 31 had to happen. And why do I say that? Well, take your Bibles and look at Matthew chapter 20. Look at Matthew chapter 20. Verses 17 to 19. Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 19. If you're there, say amen. And as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and, a son of, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be what? Mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised up on the third day. So in other words, Jesus had... And a, a, a traveling itinerary. <laughs> he, had, he had a divine, sovereign, traveling itinerary. And part of that itinerary was chapter 27, verses 27 to 31, implying that this was necessary. This had to happen. And it was a part of God's redeeming plan for those who would place their faith and trust in him. But we still haven't answered the why yet. Maybe partially. Maybe you could say, okay, Jason, the answer to why this had to happen is because God wanted it to happen. And that's true. Absolutely that's true. But it's still not getting to the why. Why the excessive mockery? Why, why, the, why, the, why the excessive humiliation? So where does this 
why begin? Where, where does truly answering the why begin? In other words, what we're, what we're seeking after is, what does it mean for us? Well, it begins with understanding one of the main themes of the Gospel of Matthew. All right? And that's found here. Take your Bibles, look at Matthew 27, verse 11. Matthew 27, verse 11. One of the main reasons why Matthew wrote his gospel was to present Jesus as the long-awaited king. Look at Matthew 27, verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. Now in the original Greek, that's a literal rendering of the original Greek, but, but in the original Greek, you might be able to smooth it over by, by saying this. Jesus actually uh, responds to the governor in the positive. He says, you're right in what you say. You're absolutely right. I am a king. And notice, as the soldiers mock Jesus in chapter 27, verses 27 to 31, they dress him up as a king because he responded to the governor in this way. He says, yes, I am a king. And so the soldiers mock him as a result of his public declaration of who he is and what he has come to do. Now take your Bibles and turn to chapter 2. Go all the way to Matthew chapter 2. So the book of Matthew closes out with Jesus being presented as a king. It also closes out with Jesus being mocked as a result of his declaration as a king. Because... Matthew begins his gospel as presenting Jesus as a king. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. And now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is the city of David, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, what? King of the Jews. So Matthew begins his gospel with these guys coming from the east seeking after this king who's been born. Matthew ends his gospel with Jesus declaring himself to be king. And his gospel ends with Jesus being mocked and humiliated and put to public shame in excessive amounts because of his declaration of of, of being a king. In fact, the book of Matthew opens up with a a genealogy, the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus. And Matthew begins his his gospel with his genealogy because he's trying to present Jesus as the royalty that we've been long, uh, that we've been waiting for. He's trying to present Jesus as the king that has been promised throughout all of human history. And so why did Jesus come come as a king? Why why did Matthew feel like he needed to present Jesus as the long-awaited king? Well, some of you would answer because of 2 Samuel chapter 7. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God tells David, David, I'm going to place on your throne my king, and there'll be no end to his kingdom. And when Jesus is born, uh, in in the book of Luke, the angel tells Mary that this son, this boy that is going to be born to you, he will sit on the throne of his father, David. But we still haven't answered the why yet. (laughs) Why did Jesus have to be mocked as a king? And what does that mean for us? Well, maybe we could go all the way back to Genesis chapter 49, where, 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 where Jacob is blessing his sons because he's about to die. And he comes to Judah and he says, Judah, the scepter shall not depart from your hand. Now, that's a strange blessing because up to that point, there, have, there hasn't been any kings in Israel. In fact, there hasn't been any Israel. Jacob and his 12 sons, they were the forefathers of the nation of Israel. And yet, Jacob tells Judah that this kingly scepter will not depart from from your hands. Well, Jesus came as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He came as the fulfillment of Genesis 49, the fulfillment of the covenant given to David as the king of kings and the Lord of lords to sit on David's throne forever. Amen? Okay, that's great. But we still haven't answered the why. Why did he have to be mocked for doing so? Well, to finally answer, answer that question, we've got to go all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1 and 2, God said, let us make man in our image. And he created man and he created woman. And they were unlike anything else in all of creation. In fact, I would argue that they were the pinnacle of creation. And God created them in such a way that he planted them in the garden as king and queen over all 
creation. In fact, the older theologians, would, would, they called Adam and Eve, that they called Adam and Eve God's vice regents or God's royal representatives on planet earth. And they were to reign and rule over all creation. They represented God. They were created, created in the image of God. And they were, at, they were to act and live and rule and reign in such a way that when, the, that when the rest of creation looked on them, they would know something about God because of, the, because of the way in which they reigned and ruled and lived their life. But what happened? Genesis 3 happened. And when Genesis 3 happened, this king and this queen, they fell from their throne and they were sent out of their kingdom and they were to live underneath the curse that, that, that was the result of their first sin. Adam was a king who fell from his throne and experienced shame and humiliation. But now Jesus has come as the greater Adam, the king of kings. And he has come to take our shame and our humiliation. Ah, now, now we are coming to the beautiful answer to the question, why? Why did Jesus come as this great and glorious king of kings? And why did he experience this shame and this humiliation and this trial to such excessive, to, to such excessive extent in Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31? He did it because we deserve that shame and that guilt and that humiliation. Put like this. The first Adam was told that if he obeyed God, then he would live. But he disobeyed God, and he died. And now the second Adam, the king of kings, is told by God that if he obeyed God, then he would die so that you may live. And that's good news, amen? The first Adam, the first king, is told that if he obeyed God, then he would be honored. But he did not obey, and thus he was sent out of the garden in shame. But the second Adam, the greater king, was told by God that if he obeyed, then he would take our shame upon himself so that we may come back into the garden, back into the presence of God, and receive honor. Now we're answering the why. Now when we look at this text and we look at Jesus taking on this shame, taking on this humiliation, taking on this mockery and standing there and absorbing it all, we understand that that should be us. The first king fell from that, and he was chased out of the presence of God in shame. But now this greater king, he comes from the presence of God to experience our shame so that he may bring us into God's presence. And that's good news, amen? Now we're answering the why. And now we can go into the depth of of, of what our King Jesus is doing here. And so let's dive into the depth of this humiliation and mockery that Jesus is taking upon himself. Take your Bibles and turn back to Matthew chapter 27. Turn back to Matthew chapter 27. And let's notice the depth to which our king was shamed, was mocked. Because as we notice the depth to which he was shamed and mocked, it will be revealed to us the depth of his love. The depth of his love toward those who deserved shame and humiliation. Notice, first of all, in Matthew 27, verse 27. If you're there, say amen. Now, notice how Matthew writes this. Matthew writes this very methodically. It's like he's ticking off a list, doesn't he? First they did this, then they did this, and then they did this. It's as if he's checking off a to-do box, a to-do list. As if he's saying this, is ne- this was necessary for Jesus to experience this so you wouldn't have to. Have to. Well, look at number one. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. Many liberal and unbelieving scholars will point to this text and say this is proof of why the Gospels are not true. Because historically this would have never happened. Because once Pilate condemned someone to death, you didn't hang around. You were immediately, immediately taken out to be crucified. You didn't hang around. You didn't, he didn't play around. He didn't keep you around. This, this kind of thing never happened. 
what starts to really push forward the divine intentionality for it. If this was unnecessary, if this, was, if this never happened, then God had a divine intended purpose for this to happen. And it was for us to see, for, to see Jesus put on humiliated display for us to go, my gosh, I'm so glad I didn't have to experience that. I'm so glad I have a Savior who died and did this in my place. Amen? So they gathered him together. They brought him into this, maybe they're, they're usually uh, in, in the governor's palace, there, there was a big open square in the middle of his palace. And what do they do? We're told they gathered the whole battalion before him. Now, some translations might actually say entire battalion. And usually in, in, in the first century, a Roman battalion consisted of 600 soldiers. And no, no. This is not a figurative all. This is not like when John the Baptist was baptizing and, and it said in all Judea came out to see John the Baptist. Well, it didn't mean, literally mean every person in Judea came out to see John the Baptist. It just meant a lot of people came out to see John the Baptist. That's not what this is. Matthew intentionally avoids that kind of language and greatly and explicitly says the whole battalion. So quite possibly 600 soldiers came out to participate in this private mockery. There was nowhere Jesus could hide. There was nowhere Jesus could go. He was brought out and laid bare before these 600 Gentiles who were mocking him, yelling at him, scoffing at him, cursing him. All so that you wouldn't have to be. All so that you would not have to experience this, the shame and humiliation and mockery for your own sin. And that's the beauty of this, brothers and sisters, amen? Jesus is completely innocent, right? What are they mocking him for? That's why Pilate washed his hands of the blood of this man. I find nothing wrong with this man. Yet there's everything wrong with us. And here Jesus is taking upon their mocking, their scoffing that's meant for us. They're speaking truth against us, but only lies against Jesus. And Jesus is absorbing everything. So that you wouldn't have to. 600 men. And notice what they do. Twice they strip him. The, the word in the original Greek literally means he was, he was naked before them. Laid bare before 600 scoffing, mocking soldiers. And if that wasn't enough, what else did they do? They spit on him. Now, are you maybe thinking, okay, God, it, this, is kind of, this is kind of too much, isn't it? Isn't this too much? And God's saying, no, it's not. <laughs> we got to keep going further because that's how far gone you are away from me and that's how far I have to go to get you and look how much my grace and love and, 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 and greatness and majesty is to reach down to grab you and bring you up to where I am. Your son, is, my son is going where you are so that you may be brought up to where I am. You're outside the garden. You're in shame and guilt and humiliation but I'm going to go out there and rescue you from that, game, that, that shame and guilt and humiliation and bring you to where I am. They strip him. 600 men are spitting on him. If that's not enough, they strike him. They spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Now notice the word struck. If you have a pen or pencil, underline the word struck because this is very important. I mean, all of it's important. The word struck in the original Greek language is in the imperfect tense. The verb is in the imperfect tense, which implies it's a repeated action. Not implies it's explicit. It's a repeated action, brothers and sisters. So it should read, and they struck him again and again and again and again, and they kept beating him on the head. And you may read the word reed. Well, that's not that bad. It's a reed. But actually, that reed was a cane pole made of bamboo. 
And it was used by soldiers that when they got out, when other soldiers got out of the line, they would bring that, that soldier out and they would publicly cane that soldier with that, with that cane staff made of bamboo. They put this, this cane staff of bamboo in the right hand of Jesus, and then in, in the midst of their mockery, they would go up and grab it, and they would beat him with it. Again and again and again. And they kept beating him on the head with it. Again, Jesus did this. Jesus experienced this kind of open display of humiliation and shame and mockery so that when you stand before God, you're not shamed because of your sin, but you are honored because of the righteousness of Christ and His grace and love, and you're welcome to do His presence. Amen? These Roman soldiers see Jesus as a massive joke. <laughs> but let me ask you, what do you see? When you look upon this text and you realize the severity of what Jesus is going through, the, the sort of seemingly unnecessary, excessive violence and humiliation that he's experiencing for you, what do you see? Do you see a massive joke? Or do you see your Savior King? Do you see the king, brothers and sisters? And what is he doing? He's being robed. <laughs> That's the beauty of this. The soldiers, in their actions, they seem to be mocking and, and making fun of Jesus, but, but inadvertently, in their actions, they're actually proving who he actually is. They robe him, but their intention is to robe him in shame. But actually, even now, even in this text, he's robed in glory and honor and majesty. And because he's doing it in our place, he places on us the robe of his glory, his majesty, and his righteousness. We deserve that robe of shame. But meant for us, is a robe of honor. <laughs> and then he's crowned. This crown was constructed. It was constructed intentionally to inflict a massive amount of pain. Jammed on top of his head. And oh yes, Jesus wears a crown. But according to the scripture, his crown is a crown of peace. A crown of love. A crown of compassion. And a crown of mercy. In our place, he was, there was much pain inflicted upon him so that we might be crowned with his peace, his love, his mercy, and his compassion. We deserve that crowning, but instead we receive the crown of Christ. And oh, let's not forget about the scepter. The kingly scepter held in the right hand signifies Signified sovereignty. I, I am, I'm the sovereign ruler of this land. And they go and snatch this, this mocking scepter out of his hand and they beat him with it as if to say, I have sovereignty over you, you weak little Jewish king. But actually with each strike, each blow, his sovereignty never diminishes. Amen? Amen. He takes each blow with love. Each strike he takes with love. So that one day we will never, we will enter into his presence and you will never feel the blow of his scepter. You only feel the loving wrap of his arms. And then fourthly, Jesus robed, Jesus crowned, Jesus praised, praised. The soldiers offer mocking praise. Hail, King of the Jews! But actually, Matthew intends to invert their irony. Throughout this whole narrative, he's the only one worthy to be praised. He stands in our place. He is scorned. He is scoffed at. He is cursed. He, there's many verbal, violent things said against him so that one day the, the voice that we hear is not the voice of scoffing, 
so that one day the voice we hear when we enter into heaven, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into my everlasting glory. Jesus heard the voice of hate so that one day we would hear the declaration and voice of sovereign love, sovereign grace, so that we may enter into the eternal sovereign presence of our God. Brothers and sisters, do you see it yet? Do you see the necessity of chapter 27, verses 27 to 31? It's not just an interlocking, interlocking narrative between his, 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 his crucifixion and, and, and his trial. It was completely necessary for him to experience humiliation, shame, and guilt so that, you won't, so that you won't have to. So that you won't have to feel the shame and guilt of your sin anymore. Are you struggling with that, brothers and sisters? Did you walk in this place with the weight of your shame and sin and guilt on your shoulders? We'll look long into our text this morning. And you'll find such freedom unlike you've never found before. You will float out of here three feet off the ground. You are free in Christ because of what Christ has done for you. Let's pray. Let's just take a few seconds. It's a moment of silence. Nobody moving around. Every head bowed and every eye closed. And if I may, I want to put this out there. There may be somebody in this room who have never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Well, beloved, let me tell you, this is what Jesus has done for you. This is what Jesus has done for you. There's no sin. There's no sin too great for his redeeming work. It's what Jesus did for you. He did it in love for you. And the Bible tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts, that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. I implore you to do that. For that's why Jesus has come. That's why Matthew 27, 27 to 31 happened. So you may be saved. Now for the rest of you who have hoped in Christ, and maybe it's been a long time since you've really contemplated the deep love of God, take this moment of silence to do just that. God, it is indeed a wondrous and marvelous and just incredible thing to contemplate that Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31, was determined before, this, before the foundation of the world. It was your plan all along to send a greater king, a mightier king, a gracious king, a loving king, to do that. For sons and daughters of the fallen king and queen. God, I pray that the love that we're all experiencing right now in this room, and I pray that we're all experiencing it, I pray that this is the motivating factor for us to live all of life, to live it for your glory, to live it motivated by your love and grace. Oh, the depth and wonder of it. I could not comprehend. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the display of your love and grace for us. And all these things ask your son's precious name and all God's people said, amen.
name. Let's sing a song of praise. Hymn number 296, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's stand and sing unto the Lord. Hallelujah. What a Savior. There is no more apt hymn to this sermon than this. Let's sing unto the Lord. receive now the benediction of our Lord from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him, to Him, be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in the grace of Christ.